Program optimization is what chapter five is about. Uh, so uh, in chapter three, we covered how programs are compiled and executed. Um, we're now gonna look at how to optimize your execution. Um, so uh, we talked about the compiler and what the compiler is gonna do is gonna take your high level C program and it's going to figure out a mapping of that program onto the machine. And it's gonna try and allocate registers for your variables. Uh, it's gonna figure out what code to use and the ordering that the code uh, uh, shows up in your assembly. And then it might eliminate minor inefficiencies in your code, uh, but it really has a difficult time improving what they call asymptotic efficiency. If you have chosen a really poor algorithm to implement your program, then no compiler in the world is gonna save you from yourself. So uh, this is what we're gonna talk about is uh, making sure that you as a programmer give the compiler the best chance at producing efficient code. Okay. Uh, and eventually you'll take the algorithms class here and then you'll understand uh, a little bit of, of, of what we're talking about. They have this big O notation. So uh, what is the order that my algorithm will run in? Is it linear, quadratic, these sorts of things. Okay, so uh, a compiler operates under a fundamental constraint. It must not cause any change in program behavior whenever it does an optimization. Your program cannot deviate from correctness because the compiler decided to choose one kind of code, uh, code uh, one kind of compilation method versus another. Uh, and this uh, often prevents it from making aggressive optimizations. Uh, now you can you can actually do the risky thing and turn the highest level of optimizations on and uh, sort of wiggle around this sort of thing. But typically, the compiler is just going to say, no, i got to be conservative when I'm compiling because I don't want to affect your correctness. Okay. So uh, most of the analysis, so as a fallout of that, uh, most of the analysis uh, that a compiler will do is performed within a procedure. Um, and one of the things with that is that if you want to optimize between procedures, it's prohibitively expensive. Uh, you can't go into the entire code base and try and select code based on what's in arbitrary spots around your code. It's just not done. Uh, and then most analysis is based on static information. It cannot make any assumptions on the runtime inputs. So if you have any input that is not statically 100% known, uh, it can't optimize uh, around that. And we'll get to this. When we actually see certain code snippets, you'll see exactly what this is. Okay, so the basic optimizations we're gonna cover today are these four, code motion, reduction in strength, uh, using registers and sharing common sub-expressions. And uh, some of these the compiler can figure out and do automatically, but most of them you'll see, they need help. Like the compiler needs you to help it out. Uh, so. Here's an example of code motion. The idea of code motion is to reduce the frequency that a specific computation is performed, um, and only if it's going to produce the same result. Uh, so one of the things that you'll do is if, you're, if you've got a scientific computation and you have this inner loop that's being called over and over again, you want to look into that inner loop and see, is there computation in there that, that is not necessary? So here's an example of an inner loop. You have a counter i and a, is the outer loop, and the inner loop's got a counter j. And then within the inner loop, you have this array access, and you're trying to get the element n times i plus j, and you're going to set it equal to b of j. So what's inefficient about this? n times i. n times i. This whole thing right here, is this multiplication is expensive. Uh, and it's being done every single inner loop iteration. Does it change within this inner loop, the, the J loop? No, <laughs> because N times I is a constant uh, within a single iteration of the inner loop. You guys all see that? All right, so this is what you want instead. Uh, what happens if I have this constant N I and in the outer loop, I'll set it to N times I. And then within this inner loop, I just use that constant ni instead. You could also do making it d squared, and instead of the addition i by one, you could increase it by dot dot one. So because you're actually stopping. Oh, we'll get to that actually. Yeah, so yeah, two more slides. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, two more slides from now. I'll get uh, maybe two. All right. So yeah, that's code motion. Uh, wait. Oh, why does that animate arms? <laughs> all right. Okay. Um. All right. So it sort of gave you the punch. I hope you didn't see that thing on the right. Um, so another uh, thing you can do is reduction in strength. Uh, so the idea here is if you have a costly operation uh, and you can find a way to replace it with a simpler one, you should do so. And we already saw this with multiplication. You can implement multiplication, integer multiplication, with bit shifts if you know that the factor that you're multiplying is a power of 2 and it's a constant. So if the program sees that and you're multiplying by 16, uh, the compiler is just going to give you this, x shifted left by 4. Okay, uh, And the utility of these optimizations are machine dependent. You sort of have to know the number of cycles that an uh, integer multiply takes in order to ensure that this optimization is going to save you uh, time. Shortest path. Uh, because essentially an operation is like a movement on a graph. And if you have multiple ways to get somewhere, you just find the shortest path. Oh, the, that kind of scheduling is done at the in the CPU, actually. The CPU might take your linear set of instructions and actually reorder. Uh, that's um, yeah, instruction scheduling at the CPU level. Uh, we'll, we won't get into that. You guys will get into that in 341, maybe. What I mean is when the compiler is actually going through and saying, okay, we can do this using a full bit shifts and then a subtraction of the bit shift one, and then just like we were seeing the other day, um, does it do like a like a tree traversal, but algorithmically? What tree is it traversing? The, uh, like a tree of efficiency or something? Like, because the, if the multiplication for this processor is only like five cycles, but the bit shift is just two or something like that, does it go, oh, I know. Like, yeah, okay. more like a table lookup. Okay. <laughs> right, like it's just going to be for every different architecture. Yeah, but then it has to say, then it has to say, hey, um, um, do I have multiple shift and add? Can I do this in parallel? Uh, that sort of thing, because you have multiple ALUs as well. Uh, so yeah, we'll get to that actually. Uh, next class, we'll get to that. Um, okay, so uh, here's the same example. Recognize sequence of products. Uh, and a different way you could re-implement this uh, is not that at all. Uh, so we did this. Uh, we did this optimization. Uh, but to get from here to another implementation, you see this multiplication. Uh, and this is, I think, what you were getting at. Um, can I replace this with something easier? Think about. Look at that algorithm. What might be a, a reduction in strength? What could I in, uh, replace? And we're going to target this thing. I'll give you. I'll give you what we're targeting. Uh, Re-implement this. And get functionally equivalent, but to not use the multiply. Uh, you can't use yeah. 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 You can change this to addition, right? So you know that the um, ni is going to start at zero, and then the first iteration is going to be n and then 2n, and then 3n. So you could replace this multiplication with a sequence of adding by n. And that's what this is, right? So rather than uh, doing this multiplication in this, in this uh, outer loop, you could set this integer to 0 at the beginning, and then every iteration at the end of this outer loop, you just add n to it. Gets rid of the multiplication. That's a reduction in strength. Like do i from zero to n squared, and have it do i is equal to i. I to n squared would execute the outer loop n ah, squared times. So you do i is equal in the incremental step. Do i is equal to i plus n squared. That makes sense. So it does it first one zero, second time n, third time n, right. times 
Okay, that would I think would be equivalent, but then you have to calculate n squared. So yeah, this is slightly better. I still think because it's still one addition. You're doing one addition in this outer loop, yeah. uh, i plus n. Uh, and then you do the one computation to make sure that you know. Both okay. Uh, I'm just curious. That is correct. Uh, I think yeah, because you're actually creating this as the counter rather than having a separate variable. You could compile it and see. <laughs> you have the RDTSC instruction now. Uh, you could write this, put the RDTSC around it, check. Uh, or compile it and then see what uh, how many instructions are implementing that. Yeah, you could put that in the outer loop. This could be part of your loop counter. Uh, you would have this multiply, this n squared multiply at the outer one, but then you do save yourself rather than having two additions in the outer loop. You would have one addition. Yeah, yeah right. you're right. We're not using i at all as part of our loop. So can we just use the uh, um, n i as our counter? That's and then we'll yeah, that's what he's he's suggesting. So it would save you an addition. You still have to do the compare. But it would save you an addition in the outer loop. So then your outer loop has to be huge in order for that to actually come out in the wash. Because uh, yeah, you're only doing it n times, so you would need a large n to show that that's actually saving you. So, well, percentage-wise, I guess it would be the same. But, all right. Yeah. It's just cutting down on one instruction. Yeah. OK, so uh, most compilers do a pretty good job with any of these array codes uh, with simple loops. So um, if you turn on uh, dash O2, which is the second level of optimization uh, in GCC, um, you'll see that a lot of times it will do code motion and reduction in strength for you. So here is our original loop. Uh, and here is what uh, GCC will give you when you compile it with dash O2. And if you look at this implementation, this is the inner loop. And you've got an add of 1 and an add quad of 128. So this is your outer loop incrementing uh, n by, or incrementing by n. And this is your inner loop incrementing that counter by one. So in effect, the compiler has figured out that this is the best way, sorry, this is the best way to implement that loop, even though you wrote this thing up here. Okay. So it's not all the time that the compiler won't be able to, to go from here to here, but you definitely want to help it out if you can. Um, does everyone sort of get this, this translation? It did, yeah. In this case, but you can't you can't always assume that it will, yeah. Did it turn it into a single loop? Uh no. This is these are two loops here. There's only. Uh, you have one. this. You have this loop up. Uh, this is the outer. Oh, there's two. Yeah, and this is the inner, and then this will go all the way back out to uh, L two. Yeah. So this is like two steps. This is an outer loop, oh, I and I then this is this is the inner loop out here, oh. and uh, this N I. Plus e ni plus equal to n is right here in red. That's why they're both red. Uh, but then it's also adding the index to i. So this is what Sean was talking about. Say you could actually get rid of this thing, uh, and then just in this compare, compare to n squared. And the n is between the n is between the n uh, Yeah, this j n e l five. That's the inner the inner loop is right here, and then this is the outer loop. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it's not going to show up on video. The inner loop is right here, the JNEL5. And then the outer loop is this JNEL2, which goes up to here. Okay. Uh, these are integers. Uh, I believe this is for integers. No, this is for, yeah. Uh, Yeah, this this uh this is N I though. So uh So you're skipping a row of A with N I. So that would be fifteen times
Yeah. Oh, you know what? It's doing the address. It's, it's not exactly this, actually, because it's using pointer arithmetic also. So this is just de this is using this as a base address. So this is actually taking the um, this a must be an array of long. Yeah, so a is an array of longs, and then it's using RDA as a base. So you're skipping the size of the row. So it's not exactly this because it's not using array notation. Yeah, this is doing a pointer thing. So this is actually incorrect. Uh, it's a pointer version of this. That's a good catch, actually. <laughs> Don't know how, how many times that's been in there. <laughs> now, if I can only uh, remember to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well. Just, isn't that what it does? I mean, technically, it's incrementing a pointer by... Um, by n times the size of of the data type of this array, which is eight, which is a long. Yeah, which is the same thing that that's doing. So it's not technically wrong. It's just it's just not calculating as as I've written it. So, all right. Well, sorry. All right. Some type on the on the, the slide itself, or you can give me small notes the next time. I'll see. I'll email you. <laughs> Actually, that, I'll I'll do this. Yeah. Fix. Oh, great. I can't. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Sure. There we go. Maybe maybe it can be like uh, an exercise next time you have like. <laughs> so you yeah. have to fix that. Now I'm wondering if this actually generated that. Let's hope. All right. All right. Uh, the next optimization is using registers. Uh, so reading and writing registers is much faster than reading and writing memory, and we talked about the memory hierarchy. So we want to keep things in registers. Those are one-cycle accesses. Um, uh, one of the things of, about uh, the compiler is that it's not always able to determine whether a variable can actually be held into a register. So sometimes it, it, if you explicitly declare a, um, a local variable uh, in your function, then that local variable can definitely be stored in a register, but there are times when the compiler uh, has, a, um, has an inability to determine this. Um, so here is an example of uh, in, in a loop where you're going to set a of 0 to be the sum of all of the elements in array b from uh, i to n. Um, and so what you want is something like this, uh, uh, an integer of uh, a temporary integer temp to be set to a of zero because this is being accumulated, uh, and then through all the elements of b, you want to accumulate onto that temp uh, variable, and then you want to assign a of zero to that temporary register. Turns out the compiler can't do this. You have to do this explicitly. Um, uh, because of this. What happens if a of 0 is an element of b? Do you think that will change the result of a of 0? How many of you think yes, and how many of you think no? And if it's yes, explain why. It changes it because if a of 0 is the first element you write, then, um, then, you'd be, then the first time around, you'd actually be doubling whatever was in the first thing. <coughs> So it wouldn't be the summation, it would be the summation of everything plus an extra of the first elements. And what happens if it's not an element? It's not and the first element, is they're separate. Hmm. Then you would get the 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 sum without that doubling of that element. Yeah, which is why the temp works. And yeah. It works in the primitive oh. So this is exactly the case. There's an implicit assumption here when you see these two things <laughs> that uh, this thing is completely separate from that thing, right? That A of 0 is not going to point into anything uh, in in B. But what happens if A and B point to the exact same array? Uh, <laughs> or you kind of it to the not thing, then you could actually use it. Yeah, you see how that changes the results? Uh, that's something uh, called aliasing, memory aliasing. And when we talk about uh, later on at the end of this class, we talk about Rust. Rust 
Uh, so the issue here is that you have both an alias and you have mutation, where you're changing something in the memory location that's aliased. Whenever you have ali aliasing with mutation, you have problems like this, where uh, you can get into trouble. So uh, Rust, as a programming language, has completely obliterated. Uh, you can get one or the other, but you can't have both. And that's the core contribution, I think, the core contribution of this programming language. You can allow aliasing, but then all of a sudden you have to give up mutation. Or if you want mutation, you can't have any alias. And this prevents memory errors like this one, or memory corruption problems, or data races, or these sorts of things from happening. So that's a pretty good one. Yeah, so if like two things have accesses to the same variable and are trying to update it, <laughs> then you know, say a uh, number of widgets left, and you have one thing, you, know, you have a supplier updating a number, and you have a, uh, a consumer uh, removing it, well, that is both aliases and mutation together, and you can get to the state where if I read the value, increment it, and then store it, uh, somebody might have gotten in there and changed the value, uh, and then I've overwritten. Doesn't that make Rust completely procedural in comparison? Because then you wouldn't be able to We'll get to that. So I didn't want to get too far down, but I just do. I, I want to forward reference that. I'm working on the Rust thing where I'm going to show you some of these patterns in Rust and how it gets rid of it. Um, so, and this is a programming language that's only two years old, so some of these examples are pretty uh, rough right now. Um, so yeah, variable in memory that can be updated in from two different uh, pointers. So this is your alias, and because of that, the compiler is not going to make this optimization until you tell it that these two things are completely separate. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk about how you could tell the compiler uh, that in a second. But this will definitely tell the compiler, hey, this is a temporary variable. I know I can use a register for that. Uh, OK. Uh, the next one is sharing common sub-expressions. Um, and the idea here is to reuse computations where possible. Uh, and so compilers are not very sophisticated in terms of exploiting uh, some of these arithmetic properties. Um, so here's an example of a two-dimensional array implemented using a single dimension, which is very similar to one of your homeworks. Uh, you have a two-dimensional array. How do you access it in a single dimension uh, access? And so uh, if you have a single dimension array trying to do a two-dimensional thing, you might have uh, something that, like this code that implements a sum of the neighbors for you, uh, if you're sort of in the two-dimensional space doing ij, then uh, to get the sum of the neighbor above you, the neighbor below you, the neighbor to the right, and the neighbor to the left, you would do something like this. You take the val of i minus 1 times n, so you get a row above it, uh, plus j. So this is your, your neighbor above you. Uh, below you is i plus 1 times n plus j. And then the left and the right is i times uh, n plus j minus 1, or plus j plus 1. And then you can get the sum as being all of these four added together. Uh, if you do this naively, uh, you're going to do separate multiplications for this value, this value, and this value, uh, when in fact you could share the sub-expressions. So um, here is an example of it being done naively. Um, where you're doing all of these multiplications to do the indi indexing. Um, what you would like is something like this. Uh, the shared product here is i times n. It's getting, uh, or i times n plus j is the shared sub-expression here. And then what you're doing is you're subtracting n, adding n, subtracting 1, or adding 1 to get to the, the left, right, top, and bottom. Uh, and this is the assembly that you get instead. <laughs> So yeah, uh, maybe some optimizing compilers can figure it out and go from here to here. Uh, but it always helps uh, for you, if you see this, to do that optimization uh, automatic, or uh, manually. I think one person actually put this thing so the software general can do what these fingers go instead. Yeah, like you're- From a developer, like they have developers that self-taught, but then you have a software engineer probably knowing all those small details will make a huge difference, like if you have something more complicated. Mm -hmm. And as a programmer, you should be habitually thinking about, well, what is this actually doing underneath? Is this actually doing a full copy of, of the thing, or is it doing a full multiplication? 
uh, and is there a more efficient way I can I can reimplement these things? So every every programming language uh, specifies certain ways that it implements certain functions, uh, and you should know those uh, those issues so that you can implement the most efficient of that language. Uh, yeah. All right, let's do an example. Uh, here's a procedure to convert strings to lowercase. Uh, so I get the string s. And then for i from 0 to the string length of s, um, if it's in between capital A and capital Z, I do a subtraction of the difference between capital A and little a. Uh, so this is basically offsetting that, that, uh, that character uh, down to the lowercase region. All right. Uh, so if the string in, is, is in n, what is the runtime uh, growing? So I'm asking you to find the order the big O notation for the runtime of, of this function. Is it going to be, and this is a, as a function of the number of characters in my string. Will this be linear, quadratic, cubic, or exponential in runtime? Probably not exponential. <laughs> linear. linear? How many people say linear? All right. How many people have a different answer? Quadratic. quadratic? Anyone else with quadratic? Anyone else going to commit cubic? Anyone? Anyone for cubic? No? Why would you say quadratic? Oh, I think it has to write the data twice. So it has to go back and forth. So it's adding to the second. That is correct. You're scanning the data twice. This string length. Uh, turns out in, in C, you scan the string to find its length. And then in the inner loop, you're also this is happening that many times. So it's n squared. Yeah, so this is exactly this is uh this is a uh, quadratic. The string length is executed every iteration, uh, and then it's uh, executed uh, the length of the string number of times. Um, so string length is linear in operation in terms of the length of the string, and it scans, the algorithm is to scan the string until it finds a null. So one of the things about strings in C is that the length is not stored with the string. This is different than in, than in other programming languages. Uh, Rust in particular stores the length of an array mm -hmm. along with the array itself. So that's an order one operation. I just have to look at the number that's stored in the data type or in the variable declaration. I'm like, that's the length. Uh, but in C, it's not. This is a scan. Um, so yeah, the overall performance is quadratic. So if you initialize your i to be greater than zero, you get the length of the data to zero, and you get the data to be greater than one. Yeah, that's the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, why didn't you do this? Uh, or why didn't the compiler do this? Uh, length is equal to string length, and then for i from 0 to that constant, uh, do this uh, loop. So uh, here's the thing. This is why the compiler can't make that optimization. It doesn't know whether or not the string length of that string is going to stay the same. And because you've written a check every single loop iteration, uh, it's going to have to honor that. Right? Because what happens if I actually modify uh, S of I somewhere and turn the null into something else? Well, you are modifying S of I. Or yeah. actually modifying the memory of that string. Yeah, you don't know. It, is that going to change the string length of, 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 of this call? So that's why it can't do that. That's why you have to do that. Because then you're like, oh, I know I'm not changing the length of the string with my, low, or I shouldn't be, with my uh, lower, lower casing of this, of this string. Yeah, you could do that as well. You could do a, a decrement. So you would still have to scan to get to the end of that. that. So it'd be equivalent, right? right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, computationally, though, you would need to initialize that counter by basically doing a string length. 
and then you would decorate. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So uh, quadratic performance of lower one is up here. Linear performance of lower two is here uh, for certain lengths of string on the bottom. Uh, and this is CPU sent. Okay, so from here on out, uh, we're going to use an example, a vector combine example for our performance. Uh, lots of time. I'm going to end early today. Um, so vector combine is our uh, example, and we're going to use this data structure. Uh, so here's your vector. It's got a, a length of size t, and this length corresponds to the number of elements in the data array. So you'll have here an array of data elements of uh, type data t. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to operate on this uh, structure. We're going to perform a computation and see what the runtime is. So this is uh, what we're doing. We're going to change the data t to be an array of integers, an array of longs, of floats, and double. And then we're going to uh, implement an operation on this data array uh, that can vary between multiplication and addition. Okay. So here are some of the functions we're going to look at. Uh, uh, the first function is to get a vector element given a pointer to this thing, an index into this data array, and then a pointer to store the element into. So that's the first one. So it retrieves the vector element at index idx in this array, and then stores it at the pointer that you give it. Uh, return zero if it's out of bounds and one if it's, if it's successful. So that's the first function. Uh, we're going to implement this uh, vector length uh, call. So given a vector v, it just returns whatever's in the length field. Um, and this is an order one operation due to the length being stored in the data structure, unlike the string length one where it has to scan. Uh, the other one is uh, get vec start, which says uh, given a vector pointer, return the data pointer here, this array pointer. Uh, and then the last one is the combine operation. And this is the, the function that we're going to uh, look at. It says given a vector pointer and a destination uh, result, uh, sort of a pointer to a destination to store the result, uh, combine all of the elements in this vector. Uh, so you're going to either add them all up or get their product, combined product, and store it in this destination. Okay, it's actually already similar. I think you said it's kind of, it's not quite. Yeah, but it's similar. I think similar. Yeah. I'm just keeping notes for <laughs> those days where I won't know what's happening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Repetition. Uh, yeah. But we're mostly going to focus on this, uh, the combined step. And then, I mean, some of the algorithms will have some of this, but that's that's just for definition's sake. Okay, uh, and we could always refer back to this slide uh, if you don't remember what certain things do. All right. So here is an example of combine one, uh, where uh, in this vector I have an array of integers. So that's my data type is an integer, um, and uh, what I'm going to do uh, with this uh, array is I am going to add all of the elements in this, this uh, vector together. So data type is, is integer. My operation for combining is addition. So I set the destination to 0, which is what you passed me. I'm going to initialize it to 0. And then I'm going to go from i is from 0 to i less than the vector length, v. Uh, and then for each element in this vector from 0 to the vector length, I'm going to get the vector element based on the vector pointer, the integer i, which is the index, into the array, uh, and then I'm going to have it store the result into this value, this local variable, and then I'm going to add it to the destination. Why aren't you doing it to the return? Why am I not doing it to the what? To the return. Oh, um... Because wouldn't that actually keep the register as the same? You should be able to see what that register is going to be through that function that gets out, and so it should be able to use it to the register. Uh, what did I say this? Uh, Especially because. Uh, because this is uh, a teaching example. <laughs> I was just, I was just yes. Uh, because uh, 
we'll see. Actually, we'll see in a couple slides why this is the doctored up example. Um, because I want to make this really horrible at the beginning. This is real. Does everyone? Well, if you don't see how horrible this yeah. is, you yeah. will soon. Yeah. Why, don't, why, do, um, why do you have the I less than the two plus two on Okay. Okay. You identified one horrible thing about this. Uh, yeah. Actually, what are other horrible things about this thing? <laughs> Just throw it out. Yeah, this is actually better than me showing it to you step by step. Just throw it out there. If you see anything horrible, let's spend a couple minutes picking apart this thing, and then you'll you'll probably be predicting slides. But that's okay. What else, what else is horrible here? Think about the four things, the four things that uh, just preceded it. Uh, you won't be able to use all of them, but like yeah. Why do you have Why am I doing what? Why, do you, why don't you just have to do less than the other one? Because they're not referencing the same thing. And so that you can pass something in that could change. Yeah, this is making it re-entrant. Basically, you pass the pointer to store the result of this computation. This is common in, in uh, a lot of calls. Um, yeah. Um, and this is especially the case if it's not a if it, it's a non-integer return value. Like, say you want to return a structured data type from your function call like in python you can store you can return like you know tuples and arrays and you know structured data types but like in c you typically are only returning primitive data types like floats or uh, ints or pointers uh, but maybe uh, maybe i'm gonna pass back a struct uh, i would need to set a pointer to that thing that maybe this function would fill in yes Yep, there's one of them. Even though this is an order one operation, the fact that it calls a function to get a vector length that probably doesn't change, probably. So that's a, what did we call that? Which one of the four is that? That's code motion. That was the first one. So there was that. Uh, no. Yeah, no, it does do that, doesn't it? Uh, or it, it the the... Probably using a register for Val. Uh, maybe. Well, no, no, it's actually not using a register for Val. Uh, well, it's using a register for Val, but then it's actually uh, copying it into the function call, yeah. Which means it has to go to stack. Yeah. Do have that space in the All right. So, so is that the other one? Which one? Like now, using val itself as a temporary in, uh, inside of the for loop. Inside the for, what do you want to do with val? Well, and you're not passing the function has to return, so you're returning the primitive. Okay. But it's easy to return primitives to the first one. Right? Uh huh. So, but not declaring it inside the for loop. And then you only have that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's going to zero it out. Uh, not sure. Not sure if it matters, but yeah, you could you could definitely put this. I think when the compiler does this, uh, it's not any overhead. Like an, uh, this allocation is done once uh, for the function. It's, it, it's not something that changes the runtime. I don't think. But shouldn't it oh, yeah, like yeah. zero out the value, or I guess if it rewrites it, it zero out the value. In the uh, yeah, it's, if you didn't reinitialize it, then the compiler doesn't have to. What's, what's the other thing? Uh, there's a couple more. Actually, um, let's let's just move on. Uh, yeah, in fact, this is code motion. And this is the first step. Okay, so this computes the sum of all all the elements uh, of this integer vector. It stores the result in the destination, and then uh, so the first one is this uh, procedure getting called in every loop iteration, but the value not changing from one iteration to the next. Uh, and so because the compiler can't make the optimization through the function call. It's going to avoid doing that optimization. So uh, this is combine two, which is our first iteration. We're going to take the length and set it to vec length. Uh, and then within this loop, we're just going to replace that call with length. Okay. So uh, even though vec length is a constant time uh, function, it's just reading that value. 
uh, there's significant overhead in doing the call. You're, you know, putting a return address onto the stack uh, and these sorts of things. Which one to a temp value? The very bottom last. Set this to a temp value. All right, there you go. There's one. Yeah, because this is hitting memory every single, every single loop iteration. You're actually going into memory and storing the result. So yeah, that's that's uh, using registers by creating temporary variables. So that's one of the optimizations. Uh, I don't think it's the next one though. Uh, oh, but first. Uh, so this is talking about why the compiler can't move that vector length call outside of the loop. Um, and so it does not know that your inner loop keeps the vector length the same. Can't make that assumption. So if you, in your inner loop, change the length of that vector by any chance, then the compiler has just produced incorrect code. Uh, all right. Uh, so... So that's not the optimization that you just talked about. Explain this optimization and how it might improve performance. Yes, this gets you the uh, base, this beginning start of the data array. Yep, that's what get fix start does. No, this is the destination that gets zeroed out. This is a data pointer. So this is the optimization. Uh, rather than uh, calling this get vec element, what it does is it says, give me the, inside the data structure, just give me the, that uh, array, the pointer to the array. That's what this line does. And then uh, what I'm going to do is rather than call get vec element, I'm just going to directly access this data using array notation. Yes? Instead of calling for the get back element to return them each time, you just take the starting point and pass that to the return arithmetic. Which is effectively the what's going to happen here, yeah. Uh, so that's basically what this is doing. You're going directly into uh, the, the, the array inside the structure, and you're using it directly rather than this very nice encapsulated API call, right? So uh, this is reduction in strength. Uh, but uh, but here's the thing. Uh, in terms of a data abstraction, this is not that clean, right? Because what you've done is that you've allowed this function to get inside and directly modify uh, sort of that object from outside of the API, right? The, the, the API that we had defined for modifying that object. So, um, yeah, not as clean, but definitely more, um, uh, more efficient. So uh, the thing that it's uh, reducing is this uh, procedure call in every inner loop, right? Rather than use a function call to get this element, I'm just going to directly use memory access to get at it. So, okay. So, and then this is the opera, uh, op optimization uh, that you had referred to. Um, so this is an op optimization where uh, when you go from here to here, what you're doing is instead of always initializing the memory location that you've been given uh, and updating it in place with the uh, sum of the data elements, uh, here you're defining, sorry, here you're defining a temporary variable sum and then rather than forcing the memory location to be updated with the sum, you increment this temporary variable with the individual elements. And then at the very end, you store the sum in this destination. Yeah. So all these optimizations the compiler is doing, or we're expected to we're, You're expected to do these. Uh, and the aliasing part of it is the thing that the compiler has difficulty. And then inter-procedure optimizations, compiler has difficulty peering into. Uh, so yeah, that's those are the reasons why you're doing this. Because, uh, and actually we'll get to the aliasing uh, next. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this is why, um, this is the, the, the benefit of doing this thing. Because memory references are expensive, uh, you wait until, to store the result into the destination until the very end. 
Um, and this avoids one memory read and one memory write per instruction or per iteration, because in order to do this operation, you need to both read memory to figure out what the old version of Stardust was, and then you're going to uh, update and then store back into desk. So the reading of Stardust and the updating of Stardust, those are eliminated in the inner loop. So that should save you a lot. You still have to go into memory to get the data, though. There's no way around that. Yeah, that's that's the big one. Can we just say that in general, like this general practice, is good to avoid having many things in our loops, like as a summary of what we. Yeah, like, you're picking apart. Just, yeah. yeah, but you need to know what to look for in terms okay. of what to get rid of. Yeah. So if you look at the assembly code between combine three and combine four, you can see exactly at the instruction level, what you're saving in between these two implementations. Uh, you see here the indexing into the array to move it into EAX. And then your this instruction right here is the painful one, right? I have to read the, op, the destination operand from memory. I have to add EAX to it. And then I have to go out and store it. That's the This is the instruction that's difficult uh, in this implementation. Whereas here, what I'm doing is I'm just adding the memory location here into a register, and then incrementing the counter, and then looping. Um, so this is the this is the instruction that's going to cause you. Uh, basically, uh, it's implemented in five instructions, and it it uh, runs in six clock cycles, uh, versus the one on the right, which is four instructions and two clock cycles that you can execute the right hand side with. Yes. So this is the optimization, and this is the you know just a tiny part of the inner loop is going to save you. Uh, a factor of, of three, right? So. Okay, but it's too bad the compiler can't do this optimization. <laughs> and uh, because uh, combine three and combine four aren't functionally equivalent, unfortunately. Uh, so the example is, and this is where your practice, uh, so uh, calculate this, uh, run combine three using the vector v and the get vector start of uh, uh, b plus 2, uh, and then combine 4 using the exact same thing. Now, uh, you should, I mean, you would want this thing to give you the exact same result, uh, but what do you get instead? So I'll give you some time to figure that out. Yeah, this is a... So the thing I should state is that this is your destination, right? I'm going to store the result here in get vec start v plus two, which is actually this this element. This is this is this thing is pointing to this element uh, for both combine three and combine four. So yeah, calculate that and see what you get. And this is the heart of memory aliasing and what it can do to computation. Okay, so uh, what did you get for combined three? 44. So this is the combined three. Um, what else? Did anyone, everyone got 44? What are other numbers that people got? You got 10. Ah, but you, you, there's this, this instruction here. Okay, so 10, what did you get for the combined four? 23. So you got something different, right? Those two things are not the same. Even though you thought that this thing was equivalent to that, you did not expect the destination to be part of this data array. So on the left, uh, so the pointer here is pointing to, to this data element. You go into combined three, and the first thing you do is set uh, the point, uh, let me see, set that uh, destination to zero. 
So in combine three, this gets zeroed out immediately. And then what you do is in this loop, you're going to accumulate the sum of the data elements uh, onto this destination. So here is uh, the first time around, this is a three. The second time around, this is a five. And then the last loop, you're adding five to itself because data i points to the exact same thing as destination. So that's where you get 10. Okay. Uh, the other one, combine four, says, um, hey, I'm going to get the beginning of this vector. Or yeah, it, it, I'm going to store that in data. And then I'm going to initialize the sum to zero. And then I'm going to go through this vector and accumulate its elements into this sum. I'm going to add 3 to 2 to 17 in this loop. And then I'm going to take that sum and store it into the destination, which is going to overwrite this 17. So this is going to be 22, 3 plus 2 plus 17. And then uh, this instruction is going to put that and set it to 22. 23, uh, close enough. Different is what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see that? Okay. So uh, combine four and combine three are not equivalent due to memory aliasing. And C has this in spades, memory aliasing. Um, and this is uh, a lot of the bugs in like Mozilla, for example. This is the reason Mozilla was like, I need a new programming language because uh, memory aliases and dereferencing aliases that no longer exist or uh, uh, what? Right, because you have, to, you have to check to see if the thing exists and if it doesn't exist, then you can add to see if it's fine. And then I do want to reference, right? Yeah, well, the whole thing, uh, you get incorrectness easily, right? Uh, you have to track everything that's been allocated. You have to make sure you never deallocate it twice. You have to make sure if you deallocated it, you don't access it ever again. Uh, and aliases are, are one of the biggest issues here. And this is what happens when, as a... Um, a data abstraction, you're given access to actual memory locations, right? This is a powerful weapon that basically you can, you know, shoot for something. Uh, so there it is. Um, so the programmer is expected to introduce these local variables uh, in order to use registers, and that's what you guys have to do. Um, okay, so uh, when you do this, it's your way of telling the compiler not to check for aliases. And there are other ways that you can tell a compiler that these memory locations don't overlap. So make sure that uh, you can optimize your code thusly. So there are, there are uh, compiler directives that we'll talk about later. OK, uh, so practice problem 5.1. Um, this is your function s. Uh, what does the procedure return uh, if xp and yp point to the same location and if xp and yp point to different locations. So uh, I want you to run through this both ways. OK. Um, it's too bad Jared's not here, because this was his favorite thing. <laughs> the in-place swap. So uh, the, this is a, uh, an implementation of trying to swap the integers stored in both of these locations without using a temporary variable. Uh, no, this is two memory locations. Uh, so rather than creating a separate location to store a temporary variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're hitting the memory subsystem a bazillion times, yeah, compared to if you used a, a temporary variable. Um, so yeah, so, but this is just to get to the memory aliasing. So uh, when you do this, xp is now x plus y. Say x, uh, uh, this points to the value x and this points to the value y. So here xp is now x plus y. Uh, when you do uh, star xp minus yp, this is taking x plus y and subtracting uh, y from it. So now yp points to x. xp still is x plus y. So the last one is you take xp, which is x plus y, and you subtract yp, which is x. 
Uh, so XP now points to Y. In place swap. I think he, he was talking about using XLOR for doing that, but same, same thing. thing. In place swap. Uh, if they point to the same location, uh, this is going to put 2x into xp, because they're both pointing to x, uh, say. Uh, and then when you do uh, star xp minus star yp, this is pointing to the same location. This is always going to give you 0. And then when you uh, subtract 0 from itself, you get 0. In place nullify. <laughs> There's no such thing. But that's basically what that is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, see if it's, you could also just do a compare instruction, uh, <laughs> which is, <laughs> well, if you want to obfuscate the program, yeah, then that's what you would do. All right. Whoops. So, uh, for the rest of this class and for next class, we're going to start measuring the performance of this combined loop using what's known as cycles per element. So if you have a, a, a data array of size n, then basically the cycles per element of processing means how many cycles does each iteration take. So you take the total number of cycles uh, for the combined loop, and then you divide it by n. That's the cycles per element. And this is a measure for how fast our algorithm is going to work. Uh, and it's basically the slope of a line, right? So here you have the number of elements. Here you have the number of cycles it takes to do the operation, and it's a line, and the slope is the number of cycles per element. How can you have a slope? How can you have not an element? Like, or not, like, you have 3.5 elements, and you can never have a half 3.5 cycles per element cycle is what this means, yeah. Yeah, but you can never have half a cycle or half an element. Uh, on the average, maybe. Yeah, we'll good. see about this. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Like There's always noise <laughs> when yeah. you're measuring these things. Where sometimes it's uh, half a cycle, sometimes it's, or sometimes it's less, it's three cycles, and sometimes it's four, depending on what. Sometimes, sometimes you can get a half cycle one. if there are two integer units. You can do things simultaneously. We'll get to this. You can get fractional, uh, fractional uh, ones. Okay, so what we're gonna, before we had integers and we had addition, uh, we're going to generalize this combined thing to to talk about uh, all sorts of data, uh, multiple kinds of data types, uh, in particular ints, longs, floats, and doubles. And in the uh, accumulation step, in the combined step, we're going to look at addition and multiplication. And the last thing is this identity uh, setting, because if it's addition, then you'll set the destination to zero initially. But if it's uh, multiplication, then the identity would be one. So that's... This is the only thing that we're doing in terms of setting up a, a combine. And we're going to compare the different implementations uh, across the different data types and the different operations on them. Um, so uh, if you run this on a benchmark, uh, on a long array, and uh, for if you run it for integers and for uh, double floating point numbers across addition, multiplication, uh, then the initial implementation, combine one, which is unoptimized, the, the, the ugly one, that we were like, yeah, you don't want to use that one, it's 22 cycles per element. That means each of the inner loops costs you 22 cycles to execute that. Um, and so, and you see that this is pretty, pretty uh, equivalent across the board, around 20 cycles. And this turns out to be a memory uh, issue because you're hitting the memory so much. The integer units can, can multiply and add uh, much faster than you going out to memory. Uh, but if you do the uh, code motion and, and these sorts of things, you can actually get uh, double performance. You can uh, get it down to 10. So if you just uh, compile this with optimization, compiler optimizations, compiler can do a reasonable job on this. Uh, we'll get this is 01, which is, you can get up to 03, I think. And 03 for things you can start getting. Yeah, you can sacrifice some, uh, I believe, some, yeah, or, yeah, behavior, I guess is what I should should say. Um, so uh, our basic optimizations, we got to combine four. We've gotten four iterations of it, was to move the vector length, uh, move this over to the uh, outside of the loop, 
avoid the balance check on each cycle. Or are we doing that? Uh, yeah, we're, we're basically just doing uh, d uh, doing direct access and then accumulating in the temporary. So after you do all of the basic optimizations from this, from uh, what we just talked about, uh, you can get all the way down to uh, about a, a cycle on the addition per per loop, uh, and then three for the multiplication, integer multiplication, and then for the addition and the multiplication of the floating point, you can get this to three and five cycles per iteration. You can do better than this, though, and that's what the next class uh, is. We're going to talk about additional ways to improve the performance of that loop. That totally reminds me of when I was doing philosophy, at, like not on yours, but for a competition where like the students were collaborating and they broke it even to like a hundred of a second or something. Like they started from something like ridiculous, like twenty, and they just broke it. So Do you remember the name of that CPF? I'll find it. I'll send you again. It was yeah. really interesting. How uh, they broke make it make that a homework assignment for this chapter, because that sounds like. Uh, well, I'd want to scaffold you up to assignment three because assignment three is uh, yes, ass assignment three is further on down the line here with the vector instructions. Uh, at the end of this, the next lecture, well, that's the segue into assignment three. Uh, so we'll get to more advanced optimizations in the next class, uh, but I'm going to stop here.